Bay. It's always a great honour to uh, rise in this house and speak on behalf of the people of Timmins James Bay, a region that exists because of the railway. Um, it's also important to talk about this bill on, on safer railways at a time when we have so many issues facing railways in Canada. It's clear. If you look at the simple uh, test for whether or not government has vision, whether government understands the issue of infrastructure, whether government has a forward-looking vision, look no further than rail. <coughs> because rail has been the kicking dog of liberal and conservative governments looking to squeeze it, to undermine it, to so-called privatize it, and we've seen a continuing loss of service while the rest of the world moves forward with smart high-speed rail. I think you know, Mr. Speaker, just this past February, where the via rain train derailed at Burlington, we had three people injured, uh, killed, 42 passengers injured. We see the $200 million in cuts that are coming to via rail now under the Conservatives. We see the undermining of rail links in important uh, jurisdictions across rural Canada, like Churchill, Manitoba. And we see this government's complete lack of interest in the importance of a high-speed rail corridor that would connect Windsor to Quebec City through our de most densest populations and allow people who are being uh, pretty much uh, trapped because of the, the density of, of traffic in the suburban regions of this country to be able to move at a reasonable rate. But nowhere do we see it more, Mr. Speaker, than in the deliberate dismantling of the Ontario Northland Railway by a government that if you look up myopic in the dictionary, there would Dalton McGuinty would be. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the Ontario Northland as an example of the failure of federal and provincial governments to address railway services. I know he's a good friend of my for the Foreign Affairs Minister, but I hope the Foreign Affairs Minister doesn't mind me castigating his friend in this House of Commons. You know, Mr. Speaker, the story of the Ontario Northland is interesting because at the turn of the last century, Queen's Park had zero interest in the land that was considered north of the French River. They didn't have any desire to spend a dime on it until they found out that Father Petitzi and the Oblates were bringing Francophone settlers over Lake Temiskaming to settle into Ontario and suddenly the good orange Protestant burghers of Queen's Park were outraged and they had to f find a way to get Anglophones up into land that was now being settled by Francophones. That was the only time they ever wanted to spend money in Northern Ontario. So they decided they'd push a rail line north of uh, Lake Temiskaming. But as they were getting to Lake Temiskaming, at mileage 103, they hit the largest silver deposits that had ever been found there, and they were found by railwaymen, Fred LaRose, was, uh, and Mr. McKinley and Mr. Dara. And suddenly, Queen's Park thought, maybe there's a use to Northern Ontario. What we'll do is we'll go up and we'll find all the resources we can, and we'll take it out. And that's been pretty much the colonial relationship between Northern Ontario and Southern Ontario ever since. And Mr. Speaker, it transformed the economy of Ontario, in particular Toronto. Toronto was a sleepy backwater at the time of the silver rush in cobalt. But so much investment dollars were coming in from the United States and from London that they needed a place to set up. And so they set up in Toronto because the train line got them within six hours of the biggest rush since the Klondike. That ease of access on the train transform economic development. And so Toronto established itself, and it still has that uh, claim today, is the largest centre for international capital for mining exploration in the world. That started from that rail line. And out of Cobalt, the prospectors went north, they went to Val d'Or in the east, they went as far as Red Lake in the west because they knew there was a value to the land. So the <laughs> Ontario Northland Railway was set up as a development corridor. And all the communities were built along that. Now, Mr. Speaker, fast forward 100 years, and the Ontario Northland still plays that important role. It's not just with trains, not just with buses. We have the role of telecommunications to isolated small communities that would otherwise pay exorbitant rates. So they are now under Ontario. Mr. Speaker, a few weeks ago, we had a flood in Fort Albany up on the James Bay coast and uh, the flood separated the community from the mainland and people were contacting me and saying they had run out of food they needed food to get up there so we spoke with the Cochrane Food Bank and we managed to secure 1200 pounds of food to get into Fort Albany and we did that through my office the question was is how are we going to get 1200 pounds of food 
to Fort Albany in the middle of this uh, flood crisis, well, we called the Ontario Northland and we said, we need you to move 1,200 pounds of freight to help this community in need. Ontario Northland said, get us to the freight yard in Cochrane tomorrow. We will get it to Moosonee. That's the end of the rail line. From there, you find how to get there. So we managed to work with Air Quebec and we got it in. It wasn't even a question when we asked the Ontario Northland, are we going to get paid to help one of our communities in Northern Ontario? They did it as a public service because they are there for the public. And I want to commend the excellent work that the Ontario Northland did in that situation. And they've done time and time and time again. So Mr. Speaker, the rail plays an important role and it's fascinating that you have the Liberal government in Ontario deciding that public transit is something that they don't invest in if it's rural public transit. That it's not right to subsidize public transit if rural people use public transit. If you're in an urban area, well, it's, it's implicitly understood that there's going to be some kind of support because public transit is not about making profit. It's about make, offering a public service. So we see the McGuinty government will exaggerate the numbers. Every time there's an investment on the Ontario Northland, they claim that's a subsidy. Mr. Speaker, how could anybody run a province if they figured that every time they had to make an investment, they were somehow subsidizing the province, subsidizing the people? The fact is, is that this is an investment just like the highways. They never say that they're subsidizing the highways, but whenever there's work that needs to be done to ensure a safe rail corridor because Mr. Speaker we have had accidents on the Ontario Northland Railway. I think of the situation south of Tomogamy about uh, 12 years ago when we had the acid tankers go over. You need to invest just like you need to invest in roads and yet there seems to be a double standard that it's okay to invest in highways even though they don't do much investing in highways in Northern Ontario I'll tell you Mr. Speaker but it's not okay to invest in freight. So in Northern Ontario on the Ontario Northland Railway we are moving thousands of tons of freight a day, and we are moving passengers. We're paying, a, it plays a unique role. And yet beside that, we have two-lane traffic run through some of the most roughest rock cuts in Canada, which is, happens to be, the Trans-Canada Highway. So it's the trucker route across Canada. So in January, Mr. Speaker, I don't know how many times I've sat at North Bay, because you're not going north, because some poor driver has hit a rock cut or hit passengers. And yet beside it, we have a perfectly safe, reasonable rail system. And the government's solution is, you know what? We're going to save a few bucks here somehow along the way, and we're going to get rid of that rail service, and we're going to put that freight, and we're going to put those passengers onto the two-lane ribbon of moose pasture that runs through northern Ontario. And somehow, that's going to be more efficient. And perhaps most galling, Mr. Speaker, was... Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, Mr. McGinty's assistant in Northern Ontario, Rick, the anti-minister of Northern Ontario, Bartolucci. And their ex explanation is, listen, the reason we're cutting out your, your development corridor, the reason we're allowing it to be cherry-picked by some pr by private sector who pick this or that but leave the rest to fall apart, is we're going to reinvest it in health care. Well, Mr. Speaker, Northern Ontarians have seen a lot of dubious mining deals over the year, and they aren't saps. And they know that for people who are getting ca cancer treatments in Kirkland Lake, Cochrane, Urquhart Falls, Timmins, New Liskert, Englehart, North Bay, that they have to go on the train to go down and get medical services. I don't know how many families I've seen on the Ontario Northlander with a sick child going down to sick kids for cancer treatments. And they can travel on the train because it's at least comfortable for the family. Yet, Dalton McGinty was telling us, don't worry, we're going to put those sick kids on a bus and you're going to get better service. Mr. Speaker, people in the North know better. And they remember how just last year the ONTC, and I don't blame them for this because they get no support for the fact that they offer public transit in the North, were actually trying to save money by excluding, <laughs> act, going into some of the most major communities on the route because they don't have enough money to serve the public. So, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about development of the rail lines and when we talk about safety, it is about an investment. And it's fascinating that the McGuinty government is looking to rip up the rails and ditch the, the development 
corporation for Northern Ontario at a time when the Ring of Fire is about to be developed. And the Ring of Fire is going to be the largest mining uh, development perhaps in the last half century, perhaps in the last century. And the fundamental question is about getting access to this ore comes from rail. So if they're going to rip up their lines, if they're going to get rid of the development corridor, the question is, is this all about a plan to take unreprocessed uh, ore and ship it off by truck to China? Thank you, Mr. Speaker.